Welcome back to Addiction, Recovery, and Mental Health, a podcast by Wiseman Method Opioid Treatment Specialists. I'm your co-host, Dwight Hurst, joined as always by David Livingston and Claire Wiseman. Today we have a question that I think takes us in a direction that, you know, I don't think we've touched on that much before, and I'm excited to hear your guys' thoughts on this. So our, our question for today is, what role does spirituality play in addiction and treatment and all that stuff? What, uh, where should we start with that? I'm going to let one of you guys uh, take the lead. I was going to let you do that today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. It, well, maybe, I, we def- I, I, it would I, help, uh, maybe it would help to define what we mean when we say spirituality first. Yeah, because you see, there is always the confusion of spirituality and religion, right? Excellent. I think it's a good point. I mean, I f- from my perspective, uh, it, it's all intertwined, and I and I I do think that you know because a- AA has a strong um, spiritual or religious component, depending on, and they leave that to the individual to kind of define. And for some people, it's very helpful. You know, AA has a a very big um, spiritual component to it. And they really leave it to the individual to define themselves what that means, whether it's got a religious base um, for them or it's it's a more a a spiritually, you know, based idea or, or feeling. And they they really leave it open to interpretation uh, by the individual. And that's probably a very good thing. I also know that there are people who don't like that component of it. And for, for their own personal reasons, don't feel like they can relate to it or want to relate to it. And so it's, it's a very personal thing, you know, for some people that they will report. and, And also there are recovery groups through churches and other organizations that you know, have a religious or spiritual um, component to it and that that people are either already a part of or want to be a part of. But I I guess the thing I would say that is important about the topic is that substance use has a strong component of needing better dependency or healthier dependency, that anywhere you can connect more deeply where there's feels like there's more connection with the people around you. There's more shared. It tends to um, um, strengthen the the process of resilience. Closeness to the people that you're you're going through it with tends to help everybody more. So, I think components, including spirituality or religion, that have that effect are, are useful. Yeah, you mentioned how some people do have a, a turnoff when they hear the term. I, th- I think because it gets intertwined, for me, the difference of spirituality, the way I kind of look at that is believing that there are things that are Im- important and maybe more important than just ourselves, like we don't exist just in a bubble on an island. And that gets intertwined sometimes with people's own experience with perhaps an organized religion, perhaps one they didn't care for, maybe especially in childhood. A lot of times people who either leave their religious community or step away or, or develop their own philosophies are not always treated well by the, the system in which they grew up, right? Um, or maybe they have other, you know, rigid experiences with, with religious rigidity, which would be damaging. Any, any kind of rigidity in our upbringing can be problematic. So I think when people hear that, they, it's intertwined in their mind, and sometimes they think, nothing there for me. But you're talking about more of a universal appeal. It's not necessarily about a church or a group or even necessarily the concept of God. Or, or it could be. But it, it, but it, it certainly can be. Yes, you're right. Yes, that's right. That's right. It's kind of left for the individual to d- decide. Yeah. I, I think not just in recovery, but, um, you know, there, there are a number of studies that uh, show that spiritual people have are healthier are happier. I think in a way it takes a bit of that uh, responsibility. I wouldn't say even responsibility. 
it takes a bit of the weight from your shoulders. You know, you're not just one. Um, is much bigger than you. There is a humbleness about it. There's uh, gratitude about it. I think it makes you a bit more part of the world, a much bigger world than the one you know we're physically in. Does that make sense? Perfectly. I think that's a great way to put it, and that it it can it can relieve part of the weight that comes with being conscious and human and having to manage all the dynamics that come with being a human being that we have to learn how to relax and not care. We have to learn how to take responsibility and care. We've got to, you know, and, and it goes on and on and on and, and in so many different ways. And, and the feeling that, you know, it kind of dovetails into that. The other topic we were going to potentially talk, talk about, which is perfectionism, just the feeling of, I don't know how I got here. I, why am I who I, I mean, and I don't know where I'm headed. I don't, right. And there's this feeling of, of just being able to be small mm-hmm. and it being okay. And, and that we're all part of that. And, you know, it connects us as human beings. And that's, I think, good for all of us. And that, that it doesn't mean, and it can't mean that we don't take responsibility as well. It's an interesting, there's a bunch of sort of balances in here to kind of resolve, I think, for people. You just you just hit upon a really big one, which is, does a sense of spirituality or my philosophies about life, does it empower me to say, you know, I'm not, I'm not terrible, I'm good, I deserve to be happy, I deserve a good life, and I can then engage with my own accountability, taking responsibility, investing in my healing? Or does it go into a place where it's like, oh, my my spirituality becomes this burden that tells me that I'm terrible and I'm sinful and dark thoughts, you know? And I, it's interesting how there's a, that can be a goal to try to develop, right? That healthy, that healthy balance between accountability and self-love and self-acceptance rather than having it skew, as you mentioned, the other extreme would be even more of a, a, a we, I guess you could say, narcissistic traits of saying like, I'm fine, so whatever I do is fine, and the rest of all, everybody out there can just lump it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's. I feel like I grouped three spiritual uh, perspectives there. <laughs> <laughs> but but do you know what I mean? Like Like that sense of balance, I think, is what you're talking about, right? Right. I think that's what you... I, I like the word you use, Claire, take the weight off your shoulders. You know, and I think that's, and while I disagree with it to, in some ways, because I think the wording and, and the verbiage is confusing, when AA tries to say you're an alcoholic, the good part of it is that like, okay, we're all here. Uh, we're working on this issue together and we're all struggling with it. And okay, we're just human in this way and we share this. And, and that could be a really helpful thing. Uh, but the other side of it is that it can then, you know, the idea that you, you're helpless only, you know, we are, we are helpless in some ways, right? We, we don't, as I've said many times, we don't necessarily decide how we feel as much as we discover it. Our, our needs are going to come, whether we like it, we have a need for connection. I mean, during COVID, there was a lot of anxiety and paranoia that developed in people because they were isolated because there's a need to be attached and have connection and feel related to. And, you know, similarly, if you're hungry, and so these needs are, are going to come, the feelings are going to come with them. And so we're, we're sort of born into this body and this, this, you know, dynamic world. And, but like Claire said, it can really help to not feel like you're responsible for everything, that there's some weight that can be taken and the recognition that we're also just small and, you know, not in charge and in control of so many things. Um, as long as it gets part of something well with, much bigger, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause ideally it should be something that is counter to loneliness and hopelessness. That would be, and I, I would even say, I would go so far as to say, if my spirituality doesn't make me feel less lonely and more collect, uh, more connected, I should say, to healthy things, 
then it isn't really serving well in its what its intended purpose, right? Right. Maybe and I, what you're saying is spirituality is, you know, your definition and how you are recognizing it maybe is not what it is, right? Yeah, and, and along those lines, there's a lot of confusion about spiritual truths or religious truths and mm-hmm. psychological truths. And while there's there's um, some overlap and some connection between the two, there's also a departure. Right. And, and so, you know, you, you, that, that, um, you know, um, to live a good life, you, you can't just, you know, uh, unless you want to go and, and live in a, a monastery, you, you know, you're still going to have to pay your water bill. Uh, otherwise, you know, uh, no matter how strong your, your belief system is, or, you know, eventually the water is going to not come. And so, you know, there's a, as there's this balance between just the practicalness of being human and understanding our needs and, and then the kind of the surrendering principle and, you know, something like that. And, and I think because there is such confusion, a lot of different treatment centers have removed spirituality from their treatment because they did not want it to be seen as religion because, you know, in the last few years, society has almost condemn religion, right? And trying to take it out of our schools and our government and everything else. So a lot of different treatment centers that I know of have removed a lot of the grounding services because they were being confused with imposing religion where they were not. They were truly just about giving people hope, uh, giving people brighter look into life and the world, not such an isolated uh, feeling of me, 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 and how am I doing and what is expected of me, but something much bigger than they are. So I think that's something that is um, going to be an issue because it was truly a good part of treatment that is being taken away because people don't understand what it really means or what it really is. I'm curious, how how do you approach that hesitancy when someone, and let's say, I mean, obviously you meet the client where they're at. If they don't want to talk about spirituality, I assume we don't you know, push that, except what if someone is, though, interested in the concepts or you're talking about the, the pros of involving spirituality and they have that, they have that hesitancy for you know, they either they look at it as, well, this is just kind of a backdoor way to sneak religion in, or they believe maybe they believe that, or they have fear or maybe even trauma, whatever their reason for hesitation is. How do you how do you feel like you, you work with that to help someone feel comfortable to develop their own spirituality? I think uh, the most important thing is uh, giving them space to um, say what they feel, what they need, just to, you know, allowing a conversation without any judgment, I think, but that goes in everything, everything. You know, I have a a family member that had um, an addiction issue for a long, long time, and I've tried everything until um, he decided to go to a spiritual place. And this is a child that never had any religious background or spiritual background or anything like this. And uh, he he found something bigger than himself, and that helped him heal. I think uh, not because of religion, but again, he just understood that there's a much bigger world out there. Mm -hmm. So I think um, how we bring in, you know, spirituality into treatment could be in so many different ways. You know, could be, uh, but it doesn't need to be a group. It doesn't need to be teachings of anything but just a truly uh, open conversation of hope and uh, kind of meditation. Uh, I mean, there's so many ways to do it. And if you look at the way that some of those things are developed, it's really interesting, the elements you see with, like, let's take uh, DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy. It was, uh, well, you know, it, it involves quite a bit of mindfulness, like you said, and there are principles of reaching inside oneself to find 
you know, the belief of DBT is that we all have wisdom accessible inside ourselves, right? That will tell us basically what's the right and wrong for us, right? The right and wrong choice uh, for us to make and the healthy choice. And there's a lot of like the objective, healthy decisions that are built into at least decision making processes. And as I'm saying that, I remember a training I was at where they talk about Marsha Linehan, who developed DBT. She uh, was either, I can't remember if she was, if she met, went all the way through and became a nun and was a former nun, or she was studying to be a nun at one point before she became a psychologist. And so there's an essence of spirituality, not religious. In fact, you could you could say she brought in more Buddhism than Christianity principles, but there's a lot of crossover of, of those things with spirituality. And so in and that's a widely accepted research based therapy that, that involves a lot of looking in into one's own philosophies of life, one's own spirituality, right? Yeah, I mean that I mean to to exact to to what you're both saying that um I believe it was Einstein who said that you can't cure the problems of the world on the same level they exist. So that like you're talking about with your family member, they, they found a different part of themselves that actually cured their problem at a different level. And I think that is a, a huge part of what, you know, and I, I, I think we, we try to cure the problems too often at the same level they exist rather than, really trying to discover what moves and what can move somebody. And it really is more of a discovery process and you have to be really open-minded and hopefully have enough general experiences and in and, and multiple ways to, to maybe help someone with that. So you could say that with mindfulness and meditation, you could, you could say that as a, as a mathematical equation that resistance um, or pain times resistance equals suffering. Okay. So, and, and this is a, there's a big crossover to this and psychotherapy and treatment. So, um, anger, fear, um, sadness, none of those things in and of themselves cause suffering. It's our resistance to them that causes the suffering and mindfulness will show you that similarly to what psychotherapy does that is you help a person feel and get to know and relax around even what are now called negative feelings which drives me crazy because it's the worst thing we can do for people is to call those things negative because it's like putting yourself at odds with yourself i, I so disagree with and i can't even what you can hear but and it's terrible it's the opposite of what a mindfulness approach is and really what a uh, an in-depth med uh uh, therapeutic approaches because what happens when we have those feelings how about we relax into them how about we don't resist them how about we get to know them and 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 understand their benefit you learn how to utilize them well how to grieve if you need to how to be strong or protective if if you're feeling angry or set some boundaries i mean so it's it kind of all dovetails into each other that's it <laughs> I, I hope I hope when you say uh, you know when you say I'll be quiet over this I hope you won't be too quiet that's not it's not good radio but <laughs> right <laughs> I no I think that's really a big part one of the things that we that keeps coming up is that phrase something bigger than us right um, and once again there's this sort of balance and not really I see I don't I don't regard it as a paradox but you could say there's a paradox there or at least a a need to balance these things, right? Where we say something bigger than us, and at the same time, you know, it's also about my own internal peace and judgment and decision making and all those things. They're they're both present, right? The the individual work as well as then being connected to something. And that that's right. That there's a process. There's a process that can heal me. And in in good therapy, the therapist knows the process and discovers it with them. And so therefore you're not responsible for healing yourself per se. Now you got to show up and participate and genuinely and, and make effort um, and, and hopefully have some enthusiasm in it. You have to do that. But the, and the same with mindfulness, you have to, you have to cross your legs and sit and 
find an object of concentration and what and and develop that but there's a process that can heal us and it takes away from this feeling that you know i i i'm flawed you know and, and but or i'm this i'm that and but okay can we discover the process that's going to help us that process you need acceptance right it, what do you mean by Self-ac- acceptance self acceptance let's as you were saying of all your feelings of who you are then you can begin to heal but first you got to accept all those feelings you were talking about and it is okay to have them a professor of mine said that all change begins with the acceptance of where we're at i i i Correct. and uh, there you go as you're saying that i think uh, i think quite a, often about what you brought up david of positive and negative feelings that term i have the same aversion to that where you know i look at that and it's like well aren't there, uh, you know, isn't it a principle of psychotherapy and psychology that there's no such thing as negative feelings, at least in the terms, the emotional definitions of those, like these feelings are bad because that, so even just by calling them that, then we gravitate towards uh, rejection instead of ex- that acceptance, right? That's not a mindful re- or healthy response. It, it, it is a new thing. Mm-hmm. And and I think it's it's a part of the new thinking and and i think it's a it has a lot to do with behavioral therapy and cbt and and as as effective and good as that approach can be in many ways and there's there's a lot of evidence that it can be very helpful and mm-hmm. in, in this way by making something negative that is an inevitable part of your inner life first of all you're going to tend to repress it second of all you're not going to get to know it to the degree you possibly could and third of all it will deaden you from being as creative and as um, dynamic a human being as you might be. And I'm not for any of that. Well, that's why I like some of the modern critiques of cognitive behavioral approaches. And I think, I think one of the problems is sometimes we look at cognitive behavioral and we just focus on the behavioral where, and, or we interpret the cognitive as push away those types. Personally, I like to go, when I talk about feelings, I like to talk about, them, if we're going to talk about them in terms of I don't want this or I want this, I I like to try to share with people the idea of you know there are some feelings that are enjoyable while I'm feeling them, and then there are others that are healthy but less enjoyable. <laughs> um, and if we're looking at negative and positive, I think that's the healthy component: is to say, yeah, I don't like when I'm mad. I want to do something about it. But actually, that's the healthy function of mad is maybe to to cue me in that there's something going on or maybe even give me some energy if I can use it in the right way. I like the term. There's a term that is getting thrown around uh, more nowadays where they talk about actual toxic positivity, right? To where if I'm, if I'm required or requiring myself to be quote positive all the time, then that's actually unhealthy because I'm thrown out, you know, I'm throwing out the, the good with the bad with the, those feelings. Right. See, I just did it. I said good and bad. What I mean, <laughs> throwing out the healthy <laughs> with the less enjoyable. I can't. You can't have the healthy development without having the unenjoyable hard work part of it, right? Well, right. That that now we we dovetail back into to mindfulness. You know, and and meditation. You know, the goal is is to develop high levels of concentration and equanimity. That means we don't have a preference. We don't, equanimity at, at its root and mindfulness is that we don't have a preference and we just observe um, these changing states and these thoughts and feelings that arise and pass away and the changing emotional states and everything else without preference. And there is such an ease and openness and a relaxation that then comes from just being able to be a human being because they're all going to come and go. Yeah, I came across a, a study that was being quoted just the other day, and I don't have the reference offhand, but that they've done some studies that, uh, all, you know, funny enough, if you're feeling even a feeling of despair, if you take a, a truly mindful approach, which you just said, and and in some like DBT and some others, they call it being an objective observer of your own feelings, right? You, When you have a feeling that is alarming or is one of these non-enjoyable or you know, I'm feeling uh, depressed or despair. I have the, this feeling hit upon me in the middle of the day. They, this study indicated that people who 
observed it and didn't try to change it one way or the other. They didn't try to do anything with it except observe it, that they reported that those feelings, the duration of the unpleasantness of that was was lower than those who tried to push it away or tried to just simply quote affirmations, uh, whatever it was, that uh, when they, essentially it was kind of saying like when you mess with the feeling, it gets, you know, it, it goes in unhealthy ways. If you watch it for a minute, the pain and, and sting of that actually wears off faster than if you try to change it. That's it. Pain times resistance, whatever the pain is or whatever the discomfort is, times resistance. I want it to go away or I don't want to be with it equals suffering because then we're at odds with ourselves. And I would say from a psychological perspective, what needs to get added to that is you have to understand the need behind it. You know, from a more meditative perspective, they don't pay much attention to that. But from a psychological perspective, if I'm sad, what do I need? Do I need to go talk to somebody? Do I, do I need to grieve? Is there something missing in my life that I need to pay more attention to? And am I lonely? And right. And so you pay attention to the needs, you know, but, but like you're saying, if you can relax into it and, and you, you will suffer less, even as you're getting to know and, and act upon the needs. And then going back to recovery, isn't that the focus of most of the patients, really? Um, you know, not being able to fulfill those needs and having to self-medicate all those feelings that they did not allow themselves to feel? Exactly, right? That you have to be able to bear yourself to stay off of, um, to need a substance. And if, if you find a way to suffer less and you can learn to just relax into yourself and let these things move around without resistance, you will suffer less. And the chances of you needing something to dull your consciousness will go way down. That's why there's a tremendous amount of evidence that meditation is useful towards recovery. When we talk about meditation, one of the things that I think is is kind of hard for people is that some people really struggle with that uh, traditional what you were you were kind of talking a minute ago about transcendental meditation, right? You sit down, cross your legs, you pick a focus word or phrase or picture, you you know, all that kind of thing. There are some people who really struggle with that, and I think finding for me, the key, that mindfulness, that, that focus on living in the present, that opens up doors for people to be able to try alternate forms. So if I go for a walk mindfully, then that can be a form of meditation, right? Or I work in my garden mindfully or something like that, that for some people who don't groove on sitting and meditating in that way, they can still engage in meditation or meditative pursuits. Hundred percent, and I'm not talking about any. I'm talking about mindfulness only, really, not transcendental or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just talking about mindfulness, and absolutely, you, you, like you said, you can be, you can be mindful throughout your day, and and whatever your your, um, you know, process is. I think people, I think having a some sort of a process to strengthen the mindfulness is often helpful, you know, and some sort of technique to do that usually helps people strengthen it, but, but you can do it in, in many, many ways. Well, how are we uh, feeling? I feel like it, it, one of the interesting things to me before we, I was going to say, what else do we want to say on this topic? But I just wanted to throw out there first. One of the fascinating things to me is that as we discuss the elements of spirituality and it goes into some of these just basic little psychological pursuits or, you know, the philosophy of spirituality and what that means to us individually. Um, for anyone who has that hesitation or bad experiences with religion, as we put it, it's not, spirituality isn't exclusive of religion. Obviously, it's involved with that for a great deal of people. On the other hand, all the things we're talking about that aren't in the religious camp, to me, those are elements of spirituality that are actually useful for someone, whether or not they happen to be religious or, you know, a person of faith as regards to God, or whether they aren't, even if they're an atheist or agnostic. It doesn't matter that these these mindfulness and spirituality principles are actually good for everyone. Uh, kind of aside from that. Oh, 
you want to comment, Claire? No, you go ahead. Yeah, I just I'd I'd agree. I think they're good for everybody, and these things, you know, um, that that you can you can increase your awareness of yourself in life in a way that actually gives you um, relief that, that, um, that, that, that mindfulness allows for that. And, um, and, 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 and that over time it will allow for that in the similar way to, I think effective therapy does where you just get comfortable with bearing yourself and you learn to relax that you don't have so much preference about what's coming up inside yourself. And over time, that muscle can get so strong that the preference of how you feel or what is, is so minimal that you're suffering less and less. And that's real. That's not fictitious. That's not a fantasy. That can be developed in anyone. And we're going to leave it there for today. Thank you so much for listening and joining Please make sure that you reach out to us if you have questions that you'd like to hear us address on the program, or if there's anything in general that you'd like to share about your experiences with addiction, treatment, mental health recovery, any of those things. We'd love to hear from you. Send your emails to info at opiates.com or visit us online, opiates.com or on Twitter at opiates. Our music is the song Medical by Clean Mind Sounds. This show is brought to you by Wiseman Method Opioid Treatment Specialists. For Claire Livingston and David Wiseman, I'm Dwight Hurst. And just want to remind you to continue to ask questions, because if you ask questions, you'll find answers. If you find answers, you can find hope. We'll be back again soon. Bye-bye for now.